Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation on the first international conference on renewable solutions for ecosystems. It's my pleasure to be here and presenting this very interesting topic that I call ultra high fidelity digital real time simulation to achieving carbon neutrality. And my name is Francisco Gonzalez Longat. I am the leader of DHNC's lab, and I am representing here Loughborough University and the University of Southeastern Norway. And before we start with the presentation, I would like to say thank you and recognize the help and the support of my colleagues and friends of different companies, especially Typhoon Hill, ABB, Arbiter System, Schweizer Engineering Laboratories, and finally Opal RT. Well, the, the, the presentation today is a relative short presentation related to the use of digital real-time simulations in order to achieve the carbon neutrality. But let's start with some context. Let's start with some information regarding the carbon neutrality. Let's start talking about the path to net zero. As you must be aware, we are in a climate emergency because the CO2 emissions that we are putting in the atmosphere, they are causing several troubles and there is a forecast that these troubles will increase over the time. So many countries around the world, they are already committed in order to reach the carbon neutrality. Of course, if we look in this slide, there are some indicators, you can see here some indicators that they are taken from one very famous website that is the net zero tracker. If you look over here, there are several countries that they already reach the net zero, the net zero as countries like Bhutan or Suriname. In those countries, of course, hydropower play a very important part of the generation mix. So as a consequence, reaching net zero is not challenging like in other countries around the world. Some of their countries are already committed and defined by law in some, some years that they will reach the carbon neutrality. Germany 2045, Sweden 2025, European Union as a globe, as, as a block is 2050, and the very specific case of the United Kingdom is by law by 2050. However, there are some local, uh, there are some local councils and regions inside the GB that they are already committed to more ambitious target. That is the case of Glasgow that is trying to reach the net zero by 2030, Manchester for 2038, and Bristol for 2030. Well, as you can see, many countries around the world, they are committed to the net zero. But the most important part, the most important part is that we have already, we have already defined a path for net zero in a global way. If you look this document that I am presenting here, this is the net zero by 2050, a roadmap for the global energy sector. This is a document created by the International Energy Agency that defines some path in order to reach net zero, considering several sectors, the electricity and heat, the industry, transport, building, and others. What is very relevant over here is that you can see that for 2030, we are assuming already 1,020 gigawatts of annual solar and wind addiction. If you look for 2035, in theory, overall net zero emissions in electricity sector will reach, it will be reached by the main advanced economies worldwide. By 2040, net zero emissions will be reached globally. And for 2050, almost 70% of the electricity production generation 
will be uh, based on solar PV and wind power. And this is a very interesting, but also very ambitious, very ambitious target. If we look the electricity sector in Britain, you can see here that in October 2021, the government set the target to reach net zero, net zero targets by 2036. 2035 for the electricity sector at the time that we ensure the security of supply. What is very important is that already the GB electrical power system has been decarbonizing. If you look over here, some of the indicators, some of the statistic indicators, you can see here a southern reduction around 65.8% per, 65 from 2013 to 2020. And what is very, very important is that we have several massive targets that we reach over the time. For instance, the maximum wind power production reached 17,500 17, two megawatts. Solar maxima production, we are talking about 9,680 megawatts. And we have been running the electrical system in, 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 the GB, in the GB basically without coal for many hours. And we are trying to minimize, of course, the dependency of the natural gas in order to balance the electrical power system. What is interesting is in 2021, and specifically on 5th of April, we reach a carbon intensity of 39 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That means that over the time we have been reaching near, near, closer, closer to zero. But let's see how the net, uh, the net zero or the zero carbon operability in GB has evolved in recent time. Here, I would like to show you some numbers, okay? On, the, on, the, on this video that you will be watching here, on the right-hand side, you can see how the electrical sector has been evolving on the reduction of CO2. What is interesting is that between 1919 and 2017, we have reduced the CO2 emissions from 600 megatons of CO2 to 367. That means that we have reduced the CO2 emissions by 47.3% lower compared with 1990. And that is very, very relevant to reach the final target of net zero. And here you can see how we reach several important, uh, several important points in the career or the path to reach the net zero. As you can see over there, we start to having reduction on the coal power plants and we start to have more and more penetration of solar wind power and also a huge penetration of wind power coming from the North Sea. Some very interesting numbers is that, for instance, in 2013, the carbon intensity was 520 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. By 2016, that number was reduced to 330 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And finally, 2020 is an impressive reduction of 65.8% of the carbon intensity, reaching 181 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. But from the operation point of view, from the operation point of view, one of the very important aspects is that the national grid electricity system operator, and that is basically the transmission system operator of the Great Britain, they define what we call the zero carbon operativity. The zero carbon operativity is an indicator. You can see here the beautiful equation defining this number, 
and is basically the ratio between the zero carbon transmission connected generation divided by the total transmission connected generation. In that sense, this indicator gives you a proportion from the total connected generation that is produced by sources that they are zero carbon. And what is impressive is by 2021, specifically the 5th of April, on the period 29, we reach a penetration, a zero carbon operativity of 84.6%. That means that we have reached a massive penetration of known pollutant or known carbon aggressive emissions generators in the GP system. We can say right now that the GP system together with Australia and some subsistence inside the United States, they are more aggressively moving to the net zero path. However, reaching net zero creates several challenges. And that is a very important question. What are the main challenges related to the secure and resilient operation of a net zero system. Well, there is nothing more to say, but there are several challenges in the case of the Great Britain system from the distribution system operator and from the integration of distributed energy resources and interconnections well, there are at least four very well identified challenges. Challenges related with the frequency of the system, challenges related with the stability, the voltage, and of course, the thermal. And those challenges are especially leading by the massive integration of, four, of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind power and also because we are increasing the interconnection capacity with the remaining countries around the UK with an impressive 17 gigawatts of interconnection. So let me show you some details about some of those very interesting challenges. For instance, one of those challenges is the sudden reduction on the fault levels. And probably you are wondering what is the reason that we are reducing the fault levels. In traditional power system, the generation is basically based on synchronous machines. And those synchronous machines, they have a very interesting and beautiful behavior during fault conditions, specifically during short circuits. It's very well known that during a short circuit, the mm, capacity of delivering short circuit contribution is extremely high. A classical synchronous machine can deliver for over a, a, a very important period of time, several times the rate current. What I'm trying to tell you is that during a short circuit, those synchronous machines, they have an impressive capacity of delivering a lot of currents. If you look over here in this very specific example, I, I am showing you the AMT simulation showing the voltages and the currents when a short circuit happened, when a short circuit happened here at the terminal of this synchronous generator. In this case, the synchronous generator is 210 MBA and a voltage level of 15.75 kilovolts. And as you can see over here, it's very impressive. We are talking about 65 kiloamps. But now, what is the situation if we remove this 210 meg uh, MBA generator and instead of using the traditional rotating machine, the synchronous machine, we use a noble solar PV plant. Well, now let me show you here the same simulation. We are considering again a 210, 210 MBA power plant. In this case, using a power converter, a grid following 
a grid following converter, and suddenly we apply a short circuit at the terminals. What is interesting here to see is that you can see that before the fall happened, we have here a very nice voltages and very nice currents. But during the short circuit, when we insert the short circuit, you can see how the current is decreased. And what is surprising and more and more important is the voltages. Something that you must understand is that the dynamic behavior of the power electronic converter is dramatically different to the synchronous machine. A power converter is not able to deliver several times the rate current or a massive overloaded. So for that reason, those devices have a very low short circuit contribution. And if we are talking about the traditional, the traditional grid following scheme, we use what we call the PLL as mechanism of synchronization to the grid. And during a short circuit, we have a sudden voltage reduction. And what is important is that depending of the short circuit ratio, we can have this problem where the voltage starts to oscillate after the short circuit is removed. Something to consider from the operation point of view and one of the, of the challenges for the operating the system. What is important to you is if we are talking about the GB system, something that has been identified is that the short circuit capacity in some regions of the UK will be reduced dramatically. Here I am presenting some of the numbers related to the reduction on the short circuit levels. And as you can see here, for at least two of the future scenarios, we are talking about to sudden reduction of the short circuit capacity until minus 60%. And that reduction on the short circuit levels has a very clear and a very important motive. The reason is the massive integration of renewable energy to reach the net zero, and in those renewable resources, we are using converters, we are using inverters as interface to the grid. And as we increase the penetration of these power converters, of course, we are having a dramatic, a dramatic reduction on the short circuit levels. So for that reason, we need to do something in order to change the way that the power system is operated, the way that the protection systems are designed in order to allow a proper, secure and reliable operation where we have scenarios with very, very decreased short circuit levels. But there are more challenges. Another challenge is the sudden reduction on voltage support and reactive power. It's very well known that the power converter is possible to produce some reactive power. Everything depends, of course, on the control loops that you enable in those power converters. But beyond that, it's also very important to know the, cap the, the available capacity to deliver this service of reactive power and voltage support. So another analysis that has been done in the GB system is how the, the reactive power needs will increase. As we start to decommission large synchronous generators installed in massive nuclear power plants and coal power plants, well, we start to have a massive reduction on the reactive power production. And that means, that means that we need to increase the requirements of the reactive power. Here, in those figures below, you can see over here, for the year 2035, for the year 2035, four different scenarios, four different scenarios, and the colors represent the need for reactive power. You can see here the scenario no progression until the scenario gone green. In those four scenarios, you can see that the reactive power, the reactive power supply and consumption will change. You can see, for instance, for the scenario gone green, 
we will need more reactive power compensation reaching level until 200 MVR at the midlands in the GP system. It's very important that we understand that these reactive powers start to be very sensitive in order to keep the voltage under control. And the reason for that is basically those new power converters. But also you must keep in mind that the behavior, the characteristic of the loads are also changing because we are installing more power converters. One example of those very interesting loads is when we are talking about the electric vehicles. And also when we are talking about new elements in the power system operation, like the, the battery energy storage system. Another problem that has been clearly identified is the sudden reduction in rotational inertia. Rotational inertia is an electromechanical property of the synchronous machine. It's something natural, it's something coming from physics. But when we start to decommission synchronous generators installed in those pollutant plants or those nuclear power plants, well, we start to decrease the total physical rotational inertia in the system. National Grid Electricity System Operator already provides several of the scenarios for the reduction of the inertia. Here, at this figure here at the, at the bottom, you can see that in the last decade, at least we have a sudden reduction of the rotational inertia of 40%. But what is very, very important is, as uh, you can see here, forecasting that is telling you that in the next 20 years, the total rotational inertia will go below 100 gigavolt uh, amperes per second. And that is very important because you must remember that the kinetic energy stored in the rotor that is represented by the rotational inertia is defined the, capac the capacity of the system to survive sudden power imbalance. So also another very interesting problem that is happening in the UK is that the size of the maximum loss in feet is increased. What I'm telling you is that in this path that we are moving in the GB system, we are increasing the size of the possible contingency. We are installing more and more HBDC interconnectors. As I say before, we are expecting to reach 17 gigawatts on those HBDC interconnectors, but we have already several interconnectors, each one of them with a capacity above 1,400 megawatts. 2021 is the commissioning of the North Sea Link, but we have in 2023 the Viking and also the new Connect and the Grid Link. And what is very, very important is that the maximum loss in feet will increase until 1.8 gigawatts when this nuclear power plant is scheduled to, uh, to, to be in service by 2027 at Hinkley Point will start operation. It's very important that we understand that the sudden reduction on the rotational inertia has impact almost in every single component of the power system dynamics. Reduction on the, synchron on the rotational inertia has a very important impact in one very important indicator of the rotor angle stability and that is the decrease of the critical clearing time. But on the other hand, for, from the small signal stability, rotational inertia has a very important aspect, a very important effect, sorry, on the damping ratio and the frequency of oscillation. And more than that, and very important is the impact that we are experiencing on the way that the frequency response is changing. As the rotational inertia reduces, the frequency start to decrease quite, quite fast. And one of the very important indicators is the rate of change of frequency, also called Rockoff. So when the rotational inertia start to decrease, the Rockoff will start to be high, but also the frequency will drop faster. 
And now we have the big question. And the big question is how do we deliver a secure and resilient operation of the net zero GB system? Well, in my opinion, I am a stronger belief of the 4D. 4D is not because you are in a movie or a cinema. 4D is the short for four very important words using the letter D. Decarbonization, decentralization, digitalization, and democratization. To be honest, I am a stronger believer that those 4D will help us to solve the problem. In which way? Well, decarbonization means that we are trying to reduce the CO2 emissions. But in that sense, in that sense, we need to engage with the customer. We need to engage with the prosumer and make the, make the customer start to use more low carbon technologies. Electric vehicles is the mechanism that is reducing tremendously and fast and very fast the CO2 emission coming from transportation. But in order to make happen those decarbonization technologies and, and be able to accelerate the integration, well, you need, you, we need to create the proper incentive making the customer participating more actively in the system, paying them and make participate them into the market. From the other point of view, the other letter D, the centralization is quite, quite important. The paradigm of those very large power plants using synchronous generators, like the massive nuclear power plants that we used to have in the past, start to change because right now, Small PV systems and small wind turbines, they are producing electricity with a very low cost. So the system is moving into more decentralized and more decentralized means that we can start to remove boundaries between transmission and distribution, creating reg regional controls and creating markets that they can operate in different directions. For that reason, decentralization is one of the very important aspects. On the other part, we have democratization. And when we talk about democratization, it's not political things. It's basically a start to think about the social ownership because, because the customer at the end, is a, it must be one very active participant into the electricity production. Public participation is a key into the democratization of the energy system. And finally, my favorite one, digitalization. Digitalization for me is extremely, extremely important because right now we have computational power. We have those beautiful mathematical modeling and mathematical tools that allow us to do many things that in the past was only a dream. We have mathematics that allow to do data driven. We have computational power that allow us to do real time and computational distributed. And all of this is enable artificial intelligence. For that reason, in 2019, I took the challenge and I create what we call the Dehensis Lab. The Dehensis Lab is basically the initials of Digital Energy System Lab. And inside the Digital Energy System Lab, we, are this, we decide to cope, to work, to do research, to innovate, to create in order to fulfill or to overcome those challenges. Inside the Dehensis Lab, we have three branches. One branch that is dedicated to a cyber physical system, another that is dedicated to digital networks, and one that is very, very important dedicated to uh, intelligent technologies. So from here in this presentation, what I would like to show you is some of the experiences inside the Dehensis Lab, something that we have done, what we have done in the past, and we are still doing in the present and we will keep doing in the future in order to reach the net zero. But to reach the net zero, we need ultra high fidelity, ultra high fidelity modeling 
the use of the digital technologies, and of course, taking advantages of decentralization. For instance, from the frequency control, we have been doing a lot in the past. We were the first to introduce the concepts of fast active power injection. Those power converters, they can be our very, very, very good friends inside the electrical power system. With the proper controllers, they, they have the possibility to respond, to provide a response that is extremely fast compared with the synchronous machine. I'm not telling you that the synchronous machine is bad. What I'm telling you is that the power converter has some very attractive characteristic that they make them quite attractive to solve some of the challenges caused by the integration of renewables. Well, with this fast active power injection, what we are doing is enable some controllers that make the power converter bidirectional, injecting or absorbing active power. Our first idea of the fast active power control was a frequency dependent controller. In that case, we decide to have two control actions, one proportional control action and one derivative control action. Here in this slide, you can see the proportional action. We include a dead band here at the very center in order to say, well, if the frequency deviates just a little bit, well, the controller will do nothing. But after the frequency deviates from the dead band, well, we start to use the proportional control action until we reach a level where the maximum power will be delivered by this power converter. And to be honest, this controller is quite suitable for a battery energy storage system because the battery energy storage system, they allow the bidirectional power flow of course, everything will be depending on the state of charge, but is one solution for controlling frequency by injecting or absorbing active power. But now what I will show you is the derivative control. The derivative control is basically taking the first derivative of the frequency over the time, or what we call the Rockoff. In general sense, the derivative control action is what a lot of people call electronics inertia or synthetic inertia or digital inertia or whatever. In those cases, this gain here at the front of the derivative control is what people call the synthetic inertia. And here we have the derivative term, the Rukov. Well, with this, with this control, we have done many things. For instance, we were able to demonstrate that if we use the appropriate optimization tool, I mean, formulating the frequency control problem using mathematical optimization, we are able to control the way of the, uh, the, the shape of the system frequency response. For instance, using distribute battery energy storage in the Nordic power system, we were able to show that we can minimize the frequency deviation from the minimum frequency, and also we were able to minimize the steady state frequency deviation. But that was the starting point, because later we start to consider that the state of charge is a very important indicator when we are modeling, when we want more fidelity on those uh, frequency response models. And later, we start to consider the state of charge. We create a more uh, high fidelity model for the batteries. And in this case, we start to include a fusil logic controller. In this case, we create the concept of multi energy storage system. Because in this case, we start to combine the different response, time response of different energy storage. It's very well known, it's very well known that the ultra capacitors, they are extremely fast in order to deliver frequency response. Then we have the flywheel. The flywheel is able to deliver a very fast response, but never faster than the ultra capacitor. And the slower one is the battery energy storage. Well, using fusil logic controller, 
we were able to consider the state of charge of the different type of energy storage system and providing the frequency response to the system, the service, and we demonstrate that this controller was able to deliver the service at the time to ensure the security and reliability of the electrical power system. But then we start to innovate using artificial intelligence. And one very interesting success on delivering this, this kind of intelligence was using agents. In 2020, we create a deep reinforcement learning controller that was doing, again, the control of multi-energy storage, ultracapacitor, flywheel, and battery energy storage. <coughs> Sorry. And in this case, the agent was taking decision what was the power that must deliver each one of those energy storage assets and at the same time considering the restriction regarding the state of charge. For that reason, we were one of the labs or one of the groups to use these data-driven technologies in order to provide uh, controllers for frequency control, okay? Most recently, we have been working with um, real-time simulation. With real-time simulation, what we have been able to demonstrate that taking measurements from the real frequency in the GB system, you can see here, we are taking measurements of the three-phase signals, voltages coming from the GB system using a phasor measurement unit we are sending those measurement units into the real-time simulator. And the idea was that in the cybernetic layer of this cyber physical system, we, we were able to include the reinforcement learning based controller in order to manage the control, the state of charge of the multi-energy system. This publication will be available at the end of this year but is already accepted for publication. Another thing that we have been doing is data-driven method for early frequency instability. And, and we have been using um, time-delayed neural networks in order to identify when a synchronous machine is disconnected inside the electrical power system. In this case, we have been using real-time simulators again to demonstrate our solution. And in this case, we are be using IC61850 as communication protocol between Typhoon Hill and the Opal RT simulator. Now I would like to show you some of the advances that we have been doing solutions regarding stability and we have been able to forecasting capability, short circuits and dynamics voltage and for right through. One of the very interesting papers that we published was related with this project, European project that is called Migrate H2020. In this Migrate 2020, when we, we move a step forward regarding controllers, because we start to use what we call the power angle modulation controller. It's very well known that the uh, mm, rotor angle stability is related with the power angle equation. So why not include a power angle modulation that allow to resynchronize or keep synchronized the synchronous machine? And that is what we have done. Using this controller integrated into wind turbines, we have been able to demonstrate a improvement, a massive improvement of the stability performance when we reach a penetration of 66% share of wind power generation. But also we have done some advances regarding thermal because we developed some smart or intelligent controllers for instance, something that is very interesting is as the PV penetration, PV penetration increase in the power systems, we start to have issues like the dock curve. The dock curve is basically this shape that we have of the apparent of the power that is moving between one transmission line 
when we have a massive PV production. PV production is very good. We want to have a lot of PV production, but sometimes the excess or the rich area related with battery, or sorry, with PV system start to create problems. For instance, you can imagine this system. If you look in this system, we have a lot of PV power plants, you can see here, and we have two transmission lines. Those two transmission lines, when they are operating together, there is no problem of overload because these two transmission lines are designed to supply all these PV system to the equivalent mm, transmission system. But if we have a contingency, one of the problems that can happen is that this transmission line will not have enough capacity to transmit all the power in this direction. Well, we, we solve the problem in a very interesting way. We can install here a battery energy storage, and when this transmission line is out the service, we start to charge this very interesting battery energy storage. And we will, and we will charge this battery energy storage, reducing the power that is transferred for this transmission line. And here we get a very important advantage because we have the possibility that during a contingency, we can reduce the overload of the transmission lines. And in this case, we are reducing the PV curtailment. But more important is that in normal operation, that battery energy storage can be used for providing other services or also to participate in the market uh, uh, allowing the owner of the PV system to produce more power when the prices are high. Another thing that we have been doing inside the DGC's lab is related with voltage control. Those, uh, those amazing power electronic converters installed in PV system or in general in distributed energy resources, the majority of those smart inverters, they can do beautiful things for keeping the balance between generation and consumption of the reactive power. So there are different paradigms that we can think about when we are talking about those smart inverters. Those smart inverters, they have the possibility of communication. And beyond having the, co the possibility of communications, also they have local controllers. So inside DHNC's lab, we have been working on creating magnificent ultra high fidelity models for those power electronic converters. And those models, they can run in real time, but also using co-simulation. In that sense, for instance, we can use the high fidelity EMT model of the power converter inside the real time simulator. In this case, we are using the framework coming from our friends of Typhoon Hill. Inside the real-time simulator, we have the physical layer, we have the real power converter with all the controllers. But we are using the Python API to create an interface with a software that is called OpenDSS. OpenDSS is a very famous software for power system RMS positive sequence simulations. So with this, with this in mind, we have the possibility of creating co-simulation where the converters are fully detailed model and we have a simplified or relatively simple model for the remaining power system. And in the middle, we have the possibility of including our, uh, our controllers, okay? So in the next slide, you will see right now that this is the way that we are operating. This is the way that we are operating. We are using OpenDSS, using the Python API, but also inside the Typhoon Hill, we have the model for the controllers. And we can run optimization, we can run optimization techniques inside the SCADA or the real-time controller and monitoring system of the Typhoon Hill system. So, we wrote several papers related with this topic, basically to optimize, to optimize, 
to optimize the reactive power production of several PV systems inside the distribution system. Here you can see a capture, a screen capture of the panel of the SCADA. What you can see here in the middle, let me, let me use my pointer here, you can see here the network. In this case, we are using the SIGRE medium voltage European network. And here you can see the integration of several PV systems. Those PV systems, of course, they have the full detail model of the power converter. But in parallel here, we have controllers, we have controllers for the power demand. And you can see here, we have controllers also for the PV power production. What is interesting is if we create any change inside the system, well, we have an activation controller, and if the voltage is above or below of the limits, well, the optimization algorithm will activate, will run an optimization, and will produce in less than 250 milliseconds the new settings for every single one of the power converters in order to optimize the power production, minimizing the losses and putting the voltage back inside the limits. And that is something that we are really proud inside the Dehensis lab. Let me do the following. We are almost running out the time, we are almost 50 minutes, but let me do the following. In this video, you can see over here, we are using the Typhoon Hill control center. In this case, this is the schematic. <coughs> right now it's compiled, going the model into the real-time simulator. And let me start the real-time simulation, okay? Right now we are compiling, we are loading the model into the real-time simulator. And now let's run the real-time simulation, okay? Now you can see that we have voltages and we will start to modify the power in the components, okay? As you can see, as we move the, volt uh, we move the powers, you can see how the voltages are changing. However, the voltage is still inside the limits, so no control action is taken. But if we modify a lot the power, or we modify the, you can see how the activation signal here is now to one. The, the, you can see how the voltages start to modify because in every single of those activations, we are running optimization to define the new settings of the converters in order to send back inside the bands the voltage. And that is very interesting because with this, we have demonstrated that we are able to run in real time smart power, com smart converters, and they are optimizing the power production based on the specification of the network. Well, we are reaching the end of this presentation. We are almost 55 minutes into the keynote, and I would like to close, your, to close my presentation with some general ideas here for you. What is very important is that you understand that reaching the net zero means a huge, a huge change inside the way that we are producing electricity, delivering electricity, and also the way that we are consuming electricity. Right now we have loads with very interesting and exciting behaviors like the electric vehicles. We have amazing devices like the battery energy storage that they provide flexibility to the operation. But at the same time, we have several challenges, but we have the tool to cope with them. For that reason, my, my main message here is if we want to have the ultra high fidelity models that we need to have to cope with the challenges of the net zero, we need to use new tools like co-simulation, real-time simulation, multi-domain simulation. Real-time simulation is a very important tool for testing, but not for the traditional testing. 
is more into the model oriented testing because the electrical power system are departing from the classical physical system with the integration of more networking and computer. Right now, the energy system, and I am talking about the whole integration of the energy system, is a huge cyber physical system. And for that reason, we need to consider this tool as taking the advantage of them in order to enable solutions to deliver the carbon neutrality. I show you some of the experiments and demonstration that we have done, especially one that we are extremely proud is this reactive real-time co-simulation reactive power controller that has demonstrated the possibility of using the real-time simulators, the ultra high fidelity models in order to maximize the integration of renewables to reach the neutrality. Well, this is my message to you, and I would like to close this very interesting presentation saying again, thank you to everyone that helped and support our laboratory research innovation. Thank you to the friends of Typhoon Hill, ABB, Arbiter, Schweizer, Opal, and thank you to all the students that day they produce so brilliant research, innovate and produce very brilliant idea. That is the future, that is the energy that will allow us to reach the carbon neutrality. I think this is the end of this presentation and now it's time for question and answer. Thank you so much. <laughs>